Hi, I'm Phil Malone and welcome to part 2 of my FTC state machine tutorial. In part 1 I cover the principles of a state machine. In part 2 I show how to design a state machine using a state transition diagram and in part 3 I walk through the code that actually implements the state machine that I describe in this part. If you'd like to go to one of the other two videos, part 1 or 3, just click on their link on the screen. The real reason we're dealing with state machines is because of the loop function, or the loop method that's part of the standard FTC op mode, um, the loop function needs to remember what it's doing each time it's called because it can only spend a short amount of time executing and then it needs to return to the main uh, program. So in order to do that, it needs to keep track of what it's doing, and it does that using a state machine. It remembers the state that the program's currently running in, so each time it comes back, it can do the code for that state, or it can change to another state. So part of that process is figuring out how to design your state machine before you start coding it. If you have a look on the screen, you'll see a very simple diagram with the main elements identified. The circles represent a state, and the name of the state, or the... Um, processing that's being performed by the state is listed inside the circle. To go from one state to another requires a transition and the transition appears as an arrow on the diagram going from one state to another, in this case state A to state B. The text above the arrow describes the event that causes the transition and the text below the arrow describes the action that gets taken as the transition occurs. So to form a larger program, it's a matter of identifying all of the states and then identifying all the events that cause transitions between them. So let's move on to a specific example. The state transition diagram that I'm going to des describe here is uh, essentially uh, one possible autonomous mode for this year's rescue competition for FTC. It goes through a sequence of states that are designed to begin in autonomous, go across the field, um, deposit the climbers in the rescue basket, and then climb the mountain. Uh, it's a fairly straight sequential sequence of operations. Um, a state transition diagram can have many cross linkages between states, but just to keep this example simple, these all occur one after the other. But that's not to say that's all you can do with a state transition diagram uh, and program, it's just what it makes it easy to describe it here. So each one of these states corresponds to an action uh, that's going to be happening during the program and will correspond to uh, a specific piece of code in the actual uh, program that we'll look at in part three. So now let's look at the state transition diagram. In each case we're going to look at what the state is, what the event that causes it to leave the state, and what actions get taken when it leaves the state. So the first state is called initial, and this is the main entry point at the beginning of autonomous. The uh, event that will cause us to leave the state, we can see at the top, is encoders at zero. So the program will uh, be looking at the encoders, waiting for them to reach zero to make sure that it's ready to start. When it sees that they're zero, it will load the path that it's going to take to the beacon and start executing it as, as an initial motion, and then it's going to transition into the drive to beacon state. In this state, the, uh, the robot is following the pre-programmed path. Uh, it's going through a sequence of legs. Each leg drives a certain distance or turns a certain amount. Uh, and the exit point for this state is the path complete. Uh, when that event occurs, uh, the robot uh, will be to the right of the white line on the opposite side of the field. So the path takes it to that point so that then it can start to approach the white line and track it in. When the path is completed, the robot starts a turn to the left to start uh, to approach the line. It's assuming that if it keeps turning, uh, eventually the light sensor on the robot will see the white line. The next state that it goes to is the locate white line state. While it's in this state, we know that the robot is turning, and so it's reading the light sensor. And the event that will get it out of this state is detecting the white line. So when it sees the light intensity jump up, it knows that it has detected the line, so it will transition out of this state into the next state, which is the follow white line. When it does that, when it detects that, that line and it does the transition, what it will start doing is it will start the tracking process. 
in the follow white line state, it's performing a standard line following routine where it's tracking the edge of the line. And if it's to the right of the line, it turns left. And if it's to the left of the line, it turns right. So this is a standard tracking routine. And the way that it's going to get out of this routine is with the next event, which is the beacon within range. Now, currently in the code, this is implemented using the optical distance um, sensor um, uh, to get a, a close range reading off of the, the beacon. So when it sees the beacon within range, it's going to transition out of this mode. And to do that, it's going to start driving forward. So it's just going to blindly start driving forward because it knows it's very close to the, to the wall. This transitions into the square with wall state. The, the reason it's doing this is because, of course, the wall is at a funny angle because it's coming across diagonally. So it's going to push into the wall uh, to square itself up. So this is the standard robot Lego League trick. The event that's going to cause it to leave this state is one second elapsed. So it's going to push against the wall for a second to square up against the wall. So when the one second elapsed event occurs, it's going to stop the motors and it's going to deploy the climbers. Now in this case that just means telling the servo to go to a new position. At which point it's transitioning into the deploy climbers state. The deploy climbers state is here just to wait a little while to give it a few seconds for the um, servo to move over and drop the climbers. So the exit point for this state is two seconds elapsed. So when two seconds have elapsed, it will transition to the next state, and along the way, it will load the path to the mountain into the path planning software. The state that it transitions into is drive to mountain. So this state, uh, while this state is, is active, it means that the robot is going through a sequence of operations once again to get just in front of the mountain. The exit point for this state is path complete, once the path is complete, it goes into a standard drive forward mode where uh, it is attempting just to drive up the mountain with a constant speed. So we enter into the climb mountain state and we sit here uh, waiting for the, uh, to give it enough time to climb up the mountain. In this case, we're just going to give it five seconds to get up the mountain. So the exiting uh, event here is five seconds elapsed. So when five seconds elapsed, we stop the motors and go into the stop state. Uh, and in the stop state, that's just the end of the autonomous routine. And it'll sit there and not do anything. So by transitioning through from each of these states, from one to the next, it'll go through the entire autonomous sequence, uh, implementing various travel methods, either fixed speed, fixed power, uh, path planning, and then it will use various sensors. So to see how we implement this, we're going to jump to the third segment of this tutorial, which is discussing the actual op mode code.